How are you today, Shirley? I'm good. And where are you? I'm in Sydney. I've lived in Melbourne for three years and now I've returned back to Sydney. Everything's going quite well here in Sydney. The social restrictions have lessened, although as you know, it may be a bit different for you in Melbourne. Yes, Melbourne has tighter restrictions because of the pandemic. I will be asking you a few questions, Shirley. As you know, it's National Week for Deaf People, which is a lovely time of year to celebrate the deaf community. The theme of this year's National Week for Deaf People is reaffirming your human rights, deaf people reaffirming their human rights. So I'd like to discuss a little, a little about, around that theme, Shirley. The theme of this year, in terms of the outcomes for achieving human rights for deaf people and yourself as a representative, what do you see yourself as having achieved, Shirley? Well, human rights isn't something that's just specific to Australian deaf people. It's specific to everyone around the world. Human rights is uh, something that hasn't been achieved as an equal access for all people around the world to communication, language, technology, and different areas in which everybody should be able to access that has not been achieved yet. The Convention of the Rights of People and Persons with a Disability stipulates that everyone has equal, should have equal access. Each nation's government has approved this convention but if we would assess whether or not some areas of society are complying with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I would have to say no, that these outcomes have not been achieved yet. Sometimes interpreters have not been provided for people that need medical care in hospitals. Sometimes subtitles haven't been provided, especially in societies where advocacy for the deaf community is a lot weaker. So what we see is that uh, certain parts of accessibility in certain parts of society have yet to be achieved as an automatic acknowledgement that these things needed to be provided to members of the deaf community. So further advocacy needs to occur in order for best practice as a deaf person to access the community. As a World Federation person, there are different parts of Australian society that need further advocacy. I have been a World Federation representative since 2015. I originally was on the board, I became secretary and then I became vice president uh, from the Paris Convention. Uh, so there has been lots of uh, things that have been occurring in terms of uh, some countries have not been acknowledging the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities and not aware that people with disabilities regard uh, uh, should have correct education, access to information in a bilingual setting. Other things that I have advocated for is centralising the person, the deaf person themselves, providing leadership, education and acknowledging that sign language is an official language. So you've been advocating for lots of different things, so your journey for advocacy doesn't just uh, have an outcome basis, it's an ongoing advocacy journey, is that right? That's correct. Advocacy is about building a society. It doesn't just have a start point and an end point. There are priorities, there's elements that need to make, that you need to have to make that advocacy effective. And one is you need to have a collective. Uh, you need to have well-researched targets in order to provide a valuable, collective, stronger, advocacy base and 
hopefully through that things will get better over time and that we need to always be looking towards the future. You were saying that some countries ignore the rights of people with disabilities, education for example. What about Australia? What's one thing that you wish was changed within Australia to make it more equal? That deaf and hearing people had, deaf people had more human rights equal to hearing people. I don't know if it would definitely, definitely would happen, but it would be nice to see sign language as an official language within the Indigenous communities. Uh, we could say uh, we acknowledge Indigenous community languages, but having that acknowledgement is not quite at the level of official language. So to have an official language, not just access to television, uh, to for people who are deaf to be able to access the community in which other people within the community could sign as well when they go to the shops for example. Uh, so it was a more uh, widespread language of use. So I'm wondering about your role as the Vice President with the World Federation. What does that involve? Well, as I said, I've been involved for five years in different roles within the World Federation. And some of those roles have been volunteer roles, unpaid because I have the passion to provide service to the community. And these volunteer roles, I would encourage other people to take on board because they could empower people within the deaf community, within the Deaf Youth Association, around the country, to become involved in the World Federation. And we have the youth officer, sorry, youth ordinary member, and we have one youth regional office in South America and there is around 157 uh, youth ordinary members now and we would like to show that a bridge can be formed between the senior members of the World Federation and the youth ordinary members and also to create those developing relationships, finding solutions and tools to work together with the board to provide our, our ideas and our planning, not for the next year ahead, but for the next four years ahead. And we would like to see the youth members more empowered, which is the category of young people under the age of 30 in this separate groups of age groups that are a part of it and the youth camp is a wonderful, wonderful activity. I think all Deaf Youth Australians should at least experience one youth camp. It's a very eye-opening experience. There is a lot of learnings that happen because you meet Deaf people from different parts of the world with different languages. And you would acknowledge as an Australian that we are actually quite advanced in some areas of our accessibility and that other areas around the world have different um, ideas about how to do things. So I know one week for the Deaf Youth Camp would not be enough. Have you been involved once, Olivia? Yes, I have. I went for one week. It wouldn't matter if it was the World Federation Camp or it was the Deaf Camp. One week is never enough. I would like to stay longer. Yes. At first, you're a bit nervous when you arrive at the camp, but by the end, you just want it to go on and on. You don't want to leave. That's true. So over the last five years, you've managed to achieve lots of outcomes. What do you think would be a very unique outcome that you're very proud of achieving? Well, I couldn't choose just one. That's difficult. Most of the individuals have a group project and we're proud of growing our youth ordinary members to, uh, membership. 
So five years ago, we would have a membership of around 25 or 27, roughly. And now our Youth Ordinary members have doubled to 50. So that's very exciting. Yes. And also, I'm excited. Recently, we managed to set up the Youth Regional Office in South America. And two or three years ago, we had discussions about setting up this youth regional office. We had to go through a documentation process and we managed to establish this office and we support that and we look forward to establishing further Oceana uh, members, which would include Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Island and uh, the, the islands contained within the Pacific Islands. So there's lots of islands, I think around 20, roughly 20 islands within the Pacific that could also be a part of the Oceana group. And we would like to see uh, a group created within this region. In Europe, they have a very strong regional collegiality and networks and the European government provide funding and support for their group. But within Oceana, there is less opportunities. So I'm hoping that there will be more opportunities created in the future, like there is in Europe and support, uh, and hopefully that will occur for us too. Right, so I think in summary, as a deaf person growing up, who was your role model who helped you want to achieve what you have achieved? Did you have someone? Well, I couldn't just pick one. Uh, there could be two or three or four even. But growing up, I had from uh, prior to primary school, I went to preschool and there were some deaf role models there that I found inspiring. There was a man called Alan Fairweather and he was a wonderful man, a, a wonderful storyteller. He could encapsulate stories within the sign language that was amazing. There was also Betty Bonza and her husband, Peter, who were able to demonstrate that deaf people can get involved in any type of work that they would like to. Peter Bonzo was lifesaver, a lifesaver, and uh, I found that very inspiring to see deaf people in roles that they wanted to do as a career. And growing up, I did see deaf teachers and one in particular, Nora Colifax, who was just a beautiful lady. I remember being on the bus and she came and sat next to me and, and I saw that she was signing and I was quite excited to see what she was communicating. Nora Colifax was uh, set up the Australian Deaf Theatre of the Deaf and I had a conversation with her maybe a few years later. She remembered that conversation that we had on the bus and uh, she told me a few of her experiences over those few years. And then uh, when I worked at the New South Wales Be Deaf Society, she would come into the office and I'd have lots of deep conversations with her. And I thought that it was a really good opportunity for young people to converse with older people within the Deaf Society of New South Wales. And unfortunately, those opportunities are quite limited where older deaf people and younger deaf people can network. So you would like to encourage more young deaf people to get involved and engaged, is that right? Yes. Now I'm involved in the World Federation. It's internationally, I'm able to meet more people like Colin Allen, uh, at the time he was World Federation of the Deaf President and I was able to work together with him and he was able to give me some guidance based on his experiences, which I can't explain how valuable that was. It was just such a big learning for me. And also Lisa Korpinanen, who is from Finland, uh, there's been some amazing people that I've met and I'm able to learn more from and uh, achieve the outcomes that what we need to during life.
our life and thank you for sharing and thank you for for imparting that you have had some great role models that are deaf throughout your life and hopefully one day you, I'm sure you will be a great role model who is deaf for other people to look up to as well and thank you for joining us during the National Week for Deaf People celebrations. Thank you. Bye-bye.